tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Danielle Bays. Danielle is the Community Cats Program Manager for the Humane Society of the United States, utilizing her skills in public policy, hands-on TNR, networking and resource development to expand the HSUS's community cat work nationwide. Formerly a member of the HSUS's wildlife team, Danielle has worked on a wide variety of animal issues including urban wildlife, bear bile, spay neuter, farm animals, and the link between violence to humans and animals. Just prior to rejoining the HSUS, Danielle served as the program manager for the Community Cats Program at the Washington Humane Society in Washington, D.C., and continues to be a strong and passionate voice for community cats in her neighborhood and city. Danielle, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So how did you get started with community cats? Well, that's an interesting story. I trapped my first cats back in the year 2000. And the first cat I trapped, I actually still have. He turned 16 this year. I'm very excited. But it was a simple situation of there were some kittens and cats in my backyard. And I talked to some friends and they set me up with a trap and directed me on where I could go to get the kittens vetted and get mom spayed. And then I took in the kittens, got them adopted out, put mom back outside. And that was kind of it. And then it wasn't until many years later when I moved into the house that I live in now and I see that there are cats everywhere. The lady next door had been feeding cats. I have no idea how long, probably the 50 years that she'd been living there. I worked with her and other neighbors to get them spayed and neutered. And I contacted our local shelter, Washington Humane Society, and their community cat program and got involved with them. You know, it was one of those situations where the program was really small back then. And I called and was trying to get an appointment and trying to get in touch with people and ended up deciding I needed to volunteer for them (laughs) because they were clearly at that point understaffed and under volunteered in that. And then it turned out that a few years later, when the person who was leaving the position of the community cat organizer, that I ended up filling that role and taking on that job. At that point, it was about a half-time position. And when I started, it was the first year it became a full-time position. Really, it just started with cats in my backyard. And then different opportunities presented themselves and you just sort of kept on saying, okay, I'll go, I'll do more. As you were with the Washington Humane Society, do you have any estimates of any of the numbers of the community cats that you were assisting at the beginning of your involvement versus at the end? Was there a substantial or significant growth rate in the number of community cats that that organization was able to assist? It was huge. Initially, they started out the program because of the need. And it was, like many programs, very reactive. People call in. There are some cats. Great. You work with them, get them to trap the cats, bring the cats to the clinic and kind of go that way. So it was kind of like, you know, whoever calls, whoever needs some help will work with those cats. I want to say the first couple of years, it was maybe like a thousand cats they were doing. And then we worked with PetSmart Charities and got some PetSmart Charities targeted grants and really started focusing the work and thinking about being proactive. Right now, the organization is spaying and neutering about 2,500 cats each year through the TNR program and has grown so that there are four full-time staff people working on the program. We have multiple vehicles to be able to go and pick up the cats. You know, when I started, we didn't even have a vehicle to use. Everyone was moving cats around in their own cars. So it's been a tremendous growth. And a lot of that has come about through the concept of targeting and really being proactive to be able to get out there in the community, see what's going on, look for cats to really be able to make a difference in the numbers that we're seeing. 
obviously, since you were the first full-time employee for the program, very hands-on and really out there working with the community. And then over time, you've shifted to working with HSUS and you're becoming a bit farther away from that hands-on, but looking more at policy issues. How has your opinion about Community Cats changed or has it stayed the same through that whole change? I think I've really developed a viewpoint on the cats and the community over the years of working hands-on and having come from a position before working hands-on with the the community cats of doing policy work and campaign work and advocacy and outreach on other animal issues and then kind of taking it to the hands-on level and then coming back to a policy level The organization I worked with is directly attached to the shelter. The organization has the animal control contract for the district. It's an open admission shelter. So there's a lot going on and there are a lot of cats that we're trying to deal with. And there's always those urgent situations. And you always think, well, these are the things that I would like to be able to do, but not really have the time to get to. So coming at it from a policy level, I'm taking that approach. I know what would have help me and the kind of things that I wish that I would have been able to spend more time on and focus on doing the day-to-day stuff. And now taking this position with HSUS, I think is a really good opportunity for me to kind of combine my previous work doing policy and my hands-on experience doing TNR into this new role. So I'm going to ask you a challenging question. If you had to make a choice, say you had an hour to spend and you had a request for assistance at a colony versus request for working on policy, is there a way to prioritize? Is one avenue more important than the other? Or do I let you take the easy way out and say that they're equally important? That is a tough question. (laughs) I think one of the things that I look at is that we really want to empower people to be able to do things. So what are we looking at for the policy? Is it going to open a pathway that's going to enable a lot more people to be able to do something that we're going to be able to help a lot more cats? Or are we really looking at just a one-off little situation? So I'd say it's hard to choose just one without more details, but I want to see like what's going to have the biggest impact and what's going to enable people to do stuff on their own. Is it that they're going to have the resources to be able to go out and talk to that neighbor? Is it that they're going to have the resources to be able to do mass trapping when they were doing, you know, just one cat at a time trapping? Or are we going to change a policy that it's going to enable an entire community to be able to do TNR when they weren't able to do that before. I guess I would say it would come down to what obstacles are in place within the community. I mean, I initially was thinking, oh, well, it's based on population. So if you're talking about a community of 3,000 people versus a city of 500,000, that you're going to be enabling a lot more with some policy work in that larger city than in that 3,000. But if I'm a small group and my community is that community of 3,000, but if there's a feeding ban or if there's a ruling in the town that says you can't TNR, our cats, then that's a big obstacle. If there's nothing in place whatsoever, and that everybody's pretty ambivalent about community cats, then creating a community cat program in that small community may not end up being a problem. So it depends on how large the obstacles are. You could just go and do your TNR program if you didn't have those legislative obstacles. But if there are some obstacles preventing your program from growing, then you have to turn your energies towards that policy issue. Right. And we, we want to also be able to empower the people in the community to help affect that legislative change. Yeah, that's much more important. I mean, when I did a project in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, I was an out-of-towner. I wasn't going to get much leverage in the community, but the residents were the ones that were able to visit with the mayor and convince the mayor to come to one of our meetings. So, you know, it's due to the residents that are getting involved. They're the ones that are able to really make the change. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people don't realize exactly how many people in the community really support the cats and what they do. I know when I first moved to my house where I live now, I was just talking to my neighbors and I found out there were about eight cats that lived here. There were probably eight different people who were feeding these same cats, but you wouldn't know about it. It wasn't obvious unless you started really talking with them about what was going on. And I think that's what we want to encourage is people to engage in the community and make it a community effort. Especially, we talk about community cats, we want to make sure we keep the community in that. And now, let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Ready to make a big difference for cats in your community? We've got an exciting opportunity that can jumpstart your efforts. 
The Community Cats podcast has launched Community Cats Grants. When you qualify for this innovative program, you'll gain valuable knowledge about how to raise funds for your spay-neuter efforts. Plus, we'll match the funds you raise up to $1,000, doubling your ability to make a difference for cats. Fundraising doesn't have to be scary. We'll be with you every step of the way. Check it out. You can find all of the details on the Community Cats podcast website under our education menu. Let's join forces to make the world a better place for community cats. So you've also done some work with HSUS with regards to wildlife and you talk about urban wildlife. So maybe can you describe specifically what urban wildlife is and then how that interacts with community cats? That's a great question. Yeah. Urban wildlife are obviously the wildlife that we find in our urban environment. And I think as our communities grow and our cities become more dense and more people are moving back into the cities, especially where I live, we have a lot more people moving in to the more densely populated urban area, you know, making sure that we're still connected with the wildlife that live here, you know, recognizing that a possum is not a rat and understanding the benefits of them. And you see a lot of that interaction between the urban wildlife and the cats. Some of them are utilizing the same resources. And those are things that we really want to be aware of and look at ways to mitigate, you know, your feeding practices for your cats that aren't going to attract wildlife that may then have other conflicts. You know, is it something that's not really good for the wildlife themselves for them to be coming and eating the cat food with the cats? Are you creating a nuisance for other neighbors who are then going to complain and then it's going to cause a problem that you didn't have before? Is it really an issue of sanitation that the cats and the raccoons are getting into the same trash? And are there things that can be done there or things that one species may be blamed for that another is causing? And really, it's all about humans and what we can do there. So it's an interesting confluence. And I think there's a lot of ways that we can address that. And a big part of it is just being aware of it. So you've had the opportunity to basically play a lot of different roles throughout this. What's your passion? What is it that really gets you excited about Community Cats? I think because there's so much opportunity to really make a difference. You know, these are cats, for the most part, that found themselves outside, no fault of their own. And there's so much that we can do, both for those cats individually as well as on a policy level, like what can we do to help prevent these cats from being there in the first place? It's something that's solvable. It's something that we can actually see an end somewhere down the line. Maybe that's my optimism, but it's not like one of those issues that you feel like there's absolutely nothing you as an individual can do. This is an area where individuals can play a very important role as well as organizations, governments. There are so many different players that can be involved here and bring communities together. I think community is really important. I think it's important for all of us to know our neighbors and talk to our neighbors and watch out for each other. And I think that the cats are just another part of that. It really is exciting to me. I actually have weird conversations with my neighbors about the cats and what they're doing. And everyone, <laughs> everyone knows the cats and where they've moved and who they're staying with and where we see them. And I've met so many of my neighbors through that and made connections on a personal level that I would just really encourage other people to do that as well. So on that note of optimism there, I'm going to ask you, what do you think life will be like for community cats over the next five to 10 years nationwide around Washington, D.C.? What are your thoughts? I think it's going to see a vast improvement. I think that the work that's done in this area is just really been ramping up so much that we're really starting to see the significant declines in kittens born outside and really making that a model. Like we're showing how the interaction with a community cat program, animal control program, HSUS Pets for Life is operating here in Washington, D.C. as a mentorship city. So looking at not just the cats that are outside, but the cats that have the potential to end up outside. How do we work with those people who might end up having their cats out on the street for one reason or another? How do we make sure that those cats stay in those homes and those people are able to continue to care for them there? You know, what can we do for those people as well? 
I think long term for community cats overall, I see more and more of a focus on integrating these kind of programs with other programs that are directed at helping people, helping house cats, helping shelters, helping wildlife, that there's really that momentum moving forward to kind of connect all these things and not just look at community cat and TNR programs as separate but as integrated into a bigger picture. I agree 100% with what you're saying. And I would love to see over the next five or 10 years, opportunities for community cats to get access to low cost spay, neuter, or other types of assistance, as well as assistance in the low income community or the areas where the nearly abandoned cats are living and be able to make sure that everybody has access to something in the community cats toolkit to be able to support them and their cat. So I too am very optimistic, but the naysayers out there are going, wait, no, no, no. <laughs> Um, But I do think that we are making great strides and I look forward to seeing what happens over the next five or 10 years and hopefully more people will go to HSUS's website and learn from there. You've actually done a training. You have a webinar up with Brian Cordes. Would you be willing to explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so our online caretaker course is a brand new self-paced course. It's actually pretty intensive. I reviewed it just trying to go through it and make sure it all was working and all put together well. And I think it took me a few hours just going through it quickly. So it's really full of information. A lot of Brian Cordes, Susie Richmond, both from Neighborhood Cats, as well as Katie Lisnick from the HSUS, who I know you've had on an earlier podcast. And it goes through the whole gamut of how to be a good caretaker. So everything from getting your cat spayed and neutered, trapping, mass trapping, how to use the drop trap, good feeding practices, deterrence, wildlife conflict. So it's really good for people who are starting out or people who want to do a better job and learn more. It's used by some organizations kind of as their certification for caretakers in their area. So I think it has a lot of applications for that. So it's a great resource, and I would encourage organizations and individuals to take a look at it. That's great. We'll make sure we get that link up in our show notes page. So, Daniel, how would people be able to find you or find out more about the Community Cats program at HSUS? We have two main websites that you can find information on our programs, humanesociety.org and animalsheltering.org. If you go to animalsheltering.org and click on the link to protect cats, you can find a wealth of information there, including some blog posts we've done about the issue and articles from our animal sheltering magazine. Or if you go to humanesociety.org and search for feral cats, there'll be another huge resource of information on things that organizations can do and individuals can do to help cats outside. And is that where you can also find the listing of feral cat organizations across the country? You believe you have a registry, right? Yes, we do. And we are encouraging organizations to update their information as well as sign up if they're not involved in that. So you can find that information both on humanesociety.org and animalsheltering.org. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Let me just mention that we had a great webinar yesterday focusing on catios, which is another area that we are exploring and doing some promotion on this, the cat patio. So I would encourage your listeners to check out our website. That webinar is recorded and will be available for people to view. This show will probably air in about a month's time. So this is now July and it'll be the end of August that the show will be on. So hopefully that catio webinar will still be up at that point in time. It should be up for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. And I hope you are willing to be on the show in the future. I would love to. Thank you so much. It was a joy being here. Thanks for listening to the Community Cats podcast. If you could go to iTunes and review the show, we'd really appreciate it. When you do, take a screenshot of your review, go to communitycatspodcast.com forward slash review and enter your information and we'll send you a t-shirt. While you're there, don't forget to check out all the ways you can support the content you're passionate about. Thanks, everyone. (coughs) 